Hi everyone, I'm Stacey Tobman, founder and CEO of Rice Collaborative. Welcome to On The Rise TV, where we feature incredible women and their story. And today, you are in for a treat. We are featuring Teresa Elder, who is not only a CEO of a major company, but also making waves in a huge nonprofit. Teresa Elder is the Chief Executive Officer and Director at the publicly traded Wide Open West, also known as WOW. Over her career, Teresa has been at the head of five different companies and has led or been involved with countless technology accomplishments including the launch of the first 4G smartphone in the U.S. All the while, she has worked tirelessly to support a cause that has touched her family, cystic fibrosis. Hi, Teresa, welcome. Good morning, how are you? I'm doing well, it's good to see you. The last time I saw you was at Ladies Who Launch. What a great event. That was a lot of fun. Yes. You brought together such an amazing group of people. I came away so inspired. Thank you, well, Sarah Fry and her team is amazing. Sarah's well, I'm great. I'm excited to talk again. I was listening to you on stage at Ladies Who Launch and just thinking, your story is incredible. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I love that you have done so much in corporate, but also in nonprofit, so we get to talk about both. I have a passion for both, there's no question about that. <laughs> well, I love talking to multidimensional women because I think we all are, and so often people get stuck in a rut. No reason to. <laughs> we can do it all if we want, yes. just maybe not all at the same time. Right, well, before we dive into all that, let's back <laughs> it on up a little bit because we are all about helping young women to create a pipeline for success. We want them to imagine being anything they want, and so I always like taking it back to your high school days. That good old question of what did you what do you want to be when you grow up? I feel like as a 16, 17 year old, I rolled my eyes at that question, but uh, how about you? You know, I probably was always very driven, you know, mm -hmm. and um, I went to an all-girl high school. Yeah. So we absolutely had the feeling that there were no limits to anything we could want to be. Women were, you know, the head of the student council and head of a debate club and head of everything there was because <laughs> it was just They ran us. the school. In fact, my class did the, the play West Side Story and the women were the Jets and the Sharks and <laughs> the whole bit. So, yeah, when I was that age, I think I I knew I wanted to go on and lead people in some way and help have an impact on society. I think back then I was probably thinking eventually I would, you know, maybe um, teach at the, you know, because that was kind of my environment. I was around teachers all yeah. the time. At a university level, I think I was interested in sociology, which is what I started majoring in, and then in college switched to business. But I knew I always wanted to make some mark on the world. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And so what was your first job when you were in high school? So my first job was when I was 15. I had to get a work permit because I wasn't quite old enough yeah. to work. I bust tables, which I, I'm sure many people start out doing things yeah. like that. It's such a great way to learn about customer service, teamwork, getting along with others, rebounding from <laughs> troubles that take place. I'll never and unhappy forget. customers. <laughs> yeah, happy customers and, you know, how to really relate to people. So I always feel like that was a great start. Yeah, I, I have worked in the restaurant industry as well. I say everyone should do restaurant and retail at some point in their I life. I think so. I did retail for about three days and that wasn't my thing. <laughs> that was the end. <laughs> so you went, you went on from your all-girl school to college and you said you started with sociology and mm -hmm. ended up in business. Mm -hmm. what, Absolutely. What caused that change? Well, I was actually actually in sociology doing work at the computer center at my university and working on a lot of sociological studies. And then I started doing research uh, for business uh, professors as well. And I knew I wanted to somehow make an impact, like I said, on society. <laughs> and I think it was one professor who really said to me, you know, you can do that maybe from a stronger place in a business role because business leaders impact society as well. And so I switched over to the business school and I think um, he was really right and gave me some great advice. And I've always done some balancing of both throughout my career, either in my role as a business executive or in my private life, yeah. um, doing a bit of both. So I feel very lucky that I, I've gotten to do most everything I've wanted to do. And, you know, I'm not done yet, that's for sure. Yeah, I think it's interesting as someone, a professor or a teacher can say that one thing that sticks with you and it, send you on a path. Well, I know as you're a former teacher I, as yeah. well, right? I'm and, hoping there's someone out there who can say that about me. Hey, the <laughs> impact that teachers can have saying the right words at the right time. Um, and I always think about that too in our role, you know, even at work, you know, that occasionally we're teachers 
teaching as well. And um, being able to give people feedback, the right feedback at the right time is so critical. It really is. And so you went from college and fast forward, you are now the CEO here in, in Colorado. You're only one of three C women CEOs of publicly traded companies. I know, isn't that ridiculous? It's a I, too low a number, but um, <laughs> it well, I'm honored to be here. went from one to now having did, three. Yeah, I was a little lonely there for a while, so I'm glad there are two more, but yes. uh, no, I feel really honored. And there are so many women who are running nonprofits or private businesses. So, you know, there are many, many powerful women in this state. There's no question about there that. There really is. Tell me a little bit about that journey to now being CEO. Right. Well, I started right out of college and I knew that I wanted to get into the technology industry. It was right at the time that the, uh, you know, technology was taking off in such a big way. And I am kind of a computer geek in many ways. I'm yeah, a math I, nerd, so, so I, Yeah, there I you go. Relate. I can totally relate. Did, yes. You know, all the math classes I could do. And you've always been a computer geek? This is something that since uh, a young yes. age? Okay. Yes. I love data. I love how it can speak and inform directions uh, and how you can really learn what's really happening from data. So I think I've always been um, inclined that way. So um, I started out um, designing a computer system uh, oh, wow. in the, um, at the time of the divestiture of the Bell system and when they were just trying to get competitive and, I, uh, and uh, having to compete for business as opposed to being a regulated entity. Yeah. And I think that kind of managerial mess and change that was taking place of a whole industry, I found that very interesting. Mm -hmm. And that's where I was thinking, oh, I'll learn all about all this change and then go back and write a thesis or something about it. <laughs> but I never went back really and did that because it was so much fun being part of it. But really my my passion is is for what we can do for society and for our customers and how the internet and um, higher speeds, more mobility has transformed the world. Yeah, it's been and, interesting to watch all the changes. Oh, I feel so lucky to have had uh, and still having my career as things are changing so rapidly really because we make such an impact on society and empowering people to do whatever they want. Like yeah. so many businesses that can um, arise because yeah. they have the power of the internet and mobility and being able to access markets they could never access before. And I love being part of that. That's and awesome. half of my career has been in um, telecom and cable and half has been in the wireless industry in the U.S. and around the world. That's interesting. And you've been very successful in your career. What is something that you attribute to your success? A, a skill or a reason? <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I guess um, maybe it is... Um, you know, I think always listening to the data, listening to your customers, and making sure that um, you're responding to a true need that's out there. And yeah. um, clearly, I mean, I think the key to most leader success is making sure you hire people who are super smart, smarter than you around you, and <laughs> listen to them. Yeah, so, that's awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm still learning about the hiring and the staff people. That for me has been a, a learning and growing opportunity. <laughs> it is. It, you know, doing that right is such a key to success, and it really it's is. so much fun to mentor and develop people and see them grow and blossom. Yeah. That's probably one of the most rewarding parts of business. Yeah, and I think um, we were talking about success. When I was younger, how I viewed success versus now how I view success has changed quite a bit. I'm curious how your definition of success has evolved through the years as you well, risen the ranks. <laughs> you know, I think early on, I was probably, you know, with my husband, we were both just in, okay, survival mode. Yes. It's like, okay, can we reach that milestone of eventually getting our first place? Or, you know, can we go from having the used car that breaks down to <laughs> <laughs> you a know, nice car, car that you, you know, those kinds of things, right. which was, you know, just achieving yeah. kind of the basic, you know, um, survival metrics. Yeah, of life. I get it. <laughs> and then um, for me, um, I always look at, uh, and I've changed roles a lot throughout my career. I look at um, what's a new and exciting challenge. Mm -hmm. Where do I feel like maybe I can uniquely make an impact? And is it fun? Oh, um, like and the that. fun is about, you know, who it can bring along in the journey with me or who I'll get to be working with. Mm -hmm. So those are, have become more my criteria, I'd say. Yeah. And being a woman in industries that sound like they're probably pretty male dominated, how have you, you know, what kind of struggles have you faced or how have you navigated that? Right. Well, I've been so fortunate to have so many incredible mentors along the way. That really makes a you difference. You know, be back to that prof yeah. you know, professor in college, but really beyond that, who have really given me great guidance, made sure that I was uh, working on what the hot topic is in the industry or for my company. So I feel like I've I've really been mentored along the way that has helped smooth out, um, you know, some of the bumps. Uh, but yeah. I would say the the number one thing is 
making sure that you seek out feedback and really, really listen to it, wanting to know the, the hard, uh, <laughs> blunt uh, feedback as, as well yes. as, you know, the niceties. You learn more from uh, maybe what you can do better. Yeah, and something I've been learning, uh, getting a lot of feedback, <laughs> is that some of my strengths that have served me really well have also been shadows at time. Um, you know, I move us. very fast and it gets things done, but it's not always easy to, to work beside me as I'm working at warp speed. I'm curious if you have any strengths that at moments in your career have also been shadows. Well, very similar to what you're saying. Uh, I tend to talk fast, um, but <laughs> you I also, both. <laughs> yeah, which I love, yeah. But I also, you know, tr like to move fast. Yeah. I get a little impatient and the key is trying to make sure you're bringing the whole organization along with yes. you and not leaving them behind. It's okay to push people maybe a little out of their comfort zone, yeah. but you have to make sure you're looping back and that folks are still with you along the way. And yeah. so learning to do that and uh, communicate to the point where you think, are you kidding me? They've got to be tired of me saying this. And then you realize, oh, maybe people are just hearing it now. I think that's a good point. That <laughs> communication piece, I think, is so hard as a leader because so much of what's happening, I assume people are in my head and understand. But really, it is important to make sure you over-communicate. So I think that's an interesting point. Yeah, and it's not just communicating what but more importantly, communicating why we're doing mm. all the things that we're doing. Uh, at WOW, in the last two years, we've really been through a transformation of the business yeah. and lots of change, lots of new leaders, lots of new products and exciting things happening, and always making sure people understand the why of what we're doing, not just what's happening. That's important too, <laughs> but um, when you give the context for what's happening, then people can put it all in perspective. I'd love for you to share on, on our show a little bit about the nonprofit work you've been doing. Right, uh, for the last, gosh, it's been close to 25 years now, mm -hmm. um, I've been involved with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. And it's not that I went out and found the Cystic Fibrosis <laughs> Foundation. Um, it, unfortunately, this disease found me. Mm -hmm. um, my son was diagnosed when he was eight years old, which is- Is that the usual age? No, not at all. Okay, um, I was like, I thought it was more no, when they're- Nationwide, um, there is now newborn screening for cystic fibrosis. Oh, interesting. But he was born right before newborn screening was implemented in the state where he was born. Okay. And so, somehow it was missed and he was a pretty normal healthy kid and then he was eight years old suddenly he was having these stomach aches he was diagnosed and um, cystic fibrosis at the time is a disease that attacks the lungs and the digestive mm -hmm. system and the life expectancy was maybe early 20s at best we didn't know if he'd even graduate high school yeah. and this was my healthy kid I had another kid as well and the same day they said wait and see, you know, you need to come and have him checked. Both of your children because could have this because it's it genetic. Okay. Yeah, it's a genetic disease. So both my husband and I had to have the recessive gene. And um, through these 25 years, it's just been one of the most amazing stories in medicine mm -hmm. because of the work of the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, which was founded back by a few moms and parents in 1955. So, I mean, this foundation goes way back. They were way ahead of their time keeping track of the database of folks who had cystic fibrosis and not wanting these children really to die. Right. They wanted to find a way to do something. The Cystic Fibrosis Foundation has been at the forefront of um, something called Venture Philanthropy, where we mm -hmm. took our donated dollars and actually invested in research at a pharmaceutical company. Oh, and the reason for that is because it's such a small orphan disease, we couldn't attract the attention yeah. of pharmaceuticals to do it on their own. Well, fast forwarding many years now, um, my son was part of a trial. He was one of the first 20 people to be the trial of a new category of medicine called precision medicine. Um, he uh, took his first medicine, February 15th was his day he took it in 2012. And just a few hours later, at 3.30 in the morning, he came running down the hallway, pounded on our bedroom door and said, mom and dad, it's working, I can breathe. And it just, it, it blew us away because at this time, you know, we didn't even want to give ourselves that, you know, hope that maybe this could be it. But it has right. been life altering. His life expectancy had, you know, it, there had been some little things that had helped since he was eight years old. So his life expectancy was maybe, you know, in uh, the 30s. All of a sudden, he probably has a normal life expectancy. Wow. And now fast forward to today, He's a family medicine doctor um, practicing and helping others and he loves to help people, especially who have long-term chronic diseases right. because he understands that struggle of having to do all these daily treatments and daily pills and uh, 
you know, he's absolutely my inspiration. He must be such a good doctor because not only does he know the medicine, he can really empathize and, and help he the does. people at ease. I think he does. And understand what they're going through. Ab absolutely. I am, I, you know, I'm so grateful. And um, for that reason, I, I sit on the board of the yeah. uh, Cystic Fibrosis Foundation Board of Trustees. And what's exciting to me is we have a whole pipeline of medicines and uh, now we have a similar treatment for 90% of those with cystic fibrosis. That last 10% is going to require something dramatically different than what right. we've done for the others and so we're really at the forefront of new technologies in medicine as well as treating the, the horrible symptoms of this yeah. disease as well. And um, one of our, our big goals too is to replicate and share our story yeah. of how we've done it, how we've had this database, how we've worked with the FDA for fast track approval, right. how we've um, gotten people involved in all the trials and really making sure we can have a knock on effect and help so many other diseases. There's you know 6,000 other genetic diseases that can be uh, helped by some of the things yeah. that the foundation has done. That's amazing. So if we go back to when he was diagnosed when he was eight, you were already in corporate America. I was. And probably oh, yeah. had quite a big career at that point. Yes, and yes. And lead us through that, and then how did you get involved in the foundation? Because I know you're pretty involved. Yes, very involved. And so I'm curious how that all came to be, juggling, well, raising two children, holding down probably a pretty high-powered job, and now getting involved in this nonprofit. Yeah, back when he was diagnosed, I was here in Colorado, uh, running what's now Verizon for okay. the Rocky Mountain region. Um, and my husband was a, a lawyer here in town. We also had a little three-year-old at, at home, another son at the time. And what we decided as a, a family was there is so much to the disease of cystic fibrosis, something like 40, 50 pills a day, uh, an hour or more of treatment every day. Wow. Uh, at least four doctor's visits every year in addition to hospitalizations and many things. And we decided one of us really needed to stay home. We couldn't just rely on nannies or others yeah. to help us. And we made the tough decision. Um, my husband actually decided mm -hmm. to stay home. Yeah. And uh, we were very pragmatic. This was before the ACA. Mm -hmm. And um, the, my insurance was better. <laughs> You know, there we just go. pragmatically speaking, <laughs> how we decided, are we going to pay for these medicines? How are we going to yeah. do this? And um, we didn't even realize what a great decision that had been. Um, the, this drug that I was telling you about that my son's on that's so life-changing, it's $300,000 a year. Now, he has his own great insurance, and sure. uh, you know, but um, those are significant impacts on people's lives, yeah. even if you're just paying you know, some portion of co-pays, and so it's a serious issue. But uh, honestly, right after my son was diagnosed, I think I was in shock for much of uh, the sure. first year and ha hardly could talk about it with almost hyperventilating. Mm. Um, and my husband, uh, you know, he just dove in immediately and actually worked really closely with the Colorado Rockies, who, unbeknownst to us, have a, a, had at the time a, a huge passion for helping cystic fibrosis, so he was involved with that. He dove in right away. It was probably about another year before I really yeah. got involved and have been involved ever since. So that's nice that you guys do it together. We do. We absolutely do. Um, my my younger son, who was three at the time, has always felt like this was the other like family business, that we always just... <laughs> do fundraisers, do events. You know, it's just our other thing we do. <laughs> so the question women get a lot is how do you do it all? And it does sound like your husband really d helps a lot, but you it's know, amazing. even the mental space that it takes up, how do you manage uh, mentally or self, what is your self care to keep you going? You know, it's gotten so much easier since this, yes. just, um, you know, drug has been approved and I don't have that constant worry um, sure. that I had. And it was really when I took this job at WOW, which was kind of the first really big operating job I've had since that drug was approved, um, I realized, oh my gosh, it, it's kind of easier to do this now because there isn't this constant worry that um, he's going to be hospitalized or will have to change things dramatically. I've actually walked away from more than one job because of his health, big I'm jobs. Sure. Yeah. Um, when I was living in Ireland, uh, I was the CEO of Vodafone Ireland. Um, and we were something like 5,000 miles away from him because he was in California going got to it. school. And he got very, very mm -hmm. sick that first year, probably lost a third of his lung function. Yeah. And uh, we just realized, okay, this isn't going to work. Sure. 
Sure. And so my husband and younger son came back to the U.S. and brought him home. And, uh, he got, you know, healthy again and was able to come on and finish college. Uh, but I stayed there about another seven months and then finally um, came back home and left because we just couldn't be that yeah. far away. So there have been some really tough decisions along the way, although at the time when you're making them, it's just so clear what you need right. to do. Yeah, but um, family is important. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. but I know how fortunate I've been that then I've taken a break at the various times and just gone whole hog on fundraising because the science was outpacing our money to fund it. And so I said, well, I don't, I, I may not be good with you know science, but I can absolutely raise money. And so I've taken time off just to do that at various times in my career. You, so you've left the career and really left focused the career. on fundraising. Yeah. Wow. And just done that for a, a couple of years at a time, and especially at times when we just knew we were on the cusp of a breakthrough and our limiting factor was uh, raising money. And I thought, well, I can do that, yeah, whatever we have to do. So I've been involved both ways. Um, and, uh, you know, you just, it, it feels so fulfilling. What I know I've been so fortunate that I've then, when I've decided, hey, now's the time to jump back in yeah. to the business career, I've been able to do that. And I know that's not always the case. So I feel very fortunate. What do you think's allowed you to do that? To well, your point, it's not always the case, but it, you've no. been able to do it and it's gone really well. So I'm curious. In fact, there was a Stanford study that said something about like uh, women jumping back in and out of the career yeah. and what kind of roles they take. And often it's a step uh, backwards. And I think we can all think of many examples. Yes. And I've been really lucky. I've been able to jump back in as a CEO. I've been able to jump back in as a president of another company. And now I'm jumping back in as a CEO <laughs> again. Um, I, I feel, uh, I guess, a couple of things. One is I have a, a, an incredible network of people that I keep in touch with. And so that helps that uh, yes. I, I'm, I'm so fortunate to have people who believe in me. The other thing I try to do, even when I'm doing nonprofit or volunteer work, is I stay absolutely up to date with what's happening in the industry, Smart. stay connected, whether it's through being on boards, being involved with the Stanford Business School and yeah. keeping up to speed on the latest in, in management and business thinking. So keeping yourself current, I think, helps too. So it doesn't sound like you were just sitting back and just popping back and saying, hire me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm back. Like, yeah. Well, and that, that social capital piece you bring up, I think, is just so important, your network. And I remember when I was younger hearing that advice. It's not what you know, it's who you know. And as a secret introvert, that would just terrify me and right. paralyze well, me. Well, network is kind of intimidating. But it really if it's is. like people, then it's like, oh, okay, well, I could do that. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, of course I want to see that person. I want to see that person. Yeah. Then it's not so scary when you think about it one-on-one. -on -one. I love it when people come to me with a purpose and say, I see that you have a connection to this person at this company. Would you be comfortable making an introduction? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we're talking about people and how they uh, impact your life. And here at Rise, we live by the quote, you are the average of the five people you mm. spend the most time with. I think it really shapes who you are, <laughs> what you believe what you think is possible. And so I'm curious uh, who one of your five are and oh. how they're impacting your life currently. Because okay. I think your five can evolve over time. You oh, know, for sure. Are, especially as you change companies or yeah. doing fundraising or a CEO of WOW. The people that are working with me now at WOW yeah. um, are amazing. Our executive team that I spend many hours with <laughs> every day. We're doing a lot of exciting things to transform this business. I guess I can think of one person in particular. I'll, I'll, I'll name names. Um, uh, Nancy <laughs> Nancy McGee, who is our chief marketing and sales officer. She's incredible. She's a Denver person here and um, actually uh, spent some time teaching at the business school at the University oh, of Denver. I but love she, me some teachers. <laughs> she was the former CMO of uh, the Stars Network and we're just so excited to have, and I've known her for 20 plus years. Yeah. So when I think about Nancy and what she has brought to the table, she continually teaches me um, how to not just be passionate about our customers, mm -hmm. but to really understand their needs and be creative in kind of looking around the quarter about what's coming next and how we can anticipate and be prepared for the future. Um, she is just uh, absolutely fearless in terms of trying things mm -hmm. and um, you know pushing the boundaries, pushing me for sure. <laughs> um, and uh, she just never gets defensive. She's always just you know, pushing Keeps forward going. for the business. And uh, I get inspired by her and, and we laugh a lot too. Humor is another big thing that <laughs> we love. I told you fun is one of my criteria. I like it. <laughs> well, I've loved hearing about your journey as CEO and you're with WOW and they're doing some incredible things. What's something you're excited about currently? 
Well, one thing I'm very excited about, some news we um, just learned is that for the second year in a row, we're being named nationally best and brightest company to work for. Wow. So we're really proud of that because it's really a recognition of what we're doing in our culture with our employees. It's all about how employees feel about the business. Yes. And I'm just you know, so honored that yeah. we're receiving this award once again. And it's national. It is. It's one of the national. And we're the only one, but we're on the <laughs> list of the nationally awarded because they also do this on a uh, city-by-city basis, and we've won it on some of the city levels as well. But to win it nationally, um, we're just so proud of that. That's amazing. It's and all about our people. I was, what is your secret to the people? It sounds like you've created an amazing culture that the people love being there. When I came to WOW, I knew it had an amazing culture and uh, a, a, a passion for our customers, but also people love being at WOW. There's a saying, some people say that we don't come to work, we come to WOW. <laughs> and uh, people really love being there, love uh, wowing our customers. We talk about that all the time. Yeah. And uh, we just really try to create a unique environment where we can be agile and that uh, challenger brand that competes against the big guys. And um, it's a fun place to be. That's awesome. Well, it has been such an honor to hear from you. you. I was so inspired at the Ladies Who Launch, and I was eager to get you back. So thank you for taking the time. Well, thank you for having me. I've loved sharing stories with you and hearing about you, too. Thank you. Thank you.